Uh, I'm Michael Melanson. I'm a uh, quality of care evangelical uh, consultant, author, wrote a book that came out 15 years ago in October called Demanding Medical Excellence, Doctors and Accountability in the Information Age, talking about patient safety well before the Institute of Medicine, um, evidence-based medicine, patient empowerment, uh, value purchasing, and all the rest of that stuff. And uh, am delighted to be here with ePatient Dave, who is, um, I'm going to use a, I'm going to use a phrase uh, that that is, is used uh, uh, in the prayer for the state of Israel in synagogues. They talk about Israel as a state being a sign of the Messiah coming. Dave de Bronckhart and Regina and all of you here are a sign of a transformation in medicine. That you are are a signal of a transformation and a paradigm shift and good things happening that is extraordinary. And part of what makes you so extraordinary is not just that you were empowered patients. That's part of it. Part of it is that many of you are here not because you're patients, but simply because you believe in this movement. Your providers, your people who are in the industry, your doctors and others. And what makes the Society for Participatory Medicine so extraordinary is that it is both providers and patients. There is nothing else like that coming together founded by a visionary physician you're going to hear about, Tom Ferguson, to empower patients. It is extraordinary. And that partnership, the, the title of the meeting that Regina gave this, partnership with patients, not patients with one disease coming together to demand that doctors cure their disease or demand that drug companies treat them better. That's not what this is. This is people with many conditions and no condition coming together to demand to be treated as partners, a, par a sharing, very, very different. So this is a unique meeting, a unique zeitgeist. And it's not easy to characterize because it's not traditional, it's very untraditional, but it is the new paradigm. The other thing about this meeting is even though it says partnership with patients, that really should come with an asterisk. As you can tell from everything Regina has, has said, this is also a partnership among patients. So we are partnering with each other. We are learning with each other and from each other. We are partners with each other on this journey. And that's extraordinarily important. And that's, again, um, why I'm involved with the Society for Participatory Medicine. Um, how many of you are members of, the, of SPM? A lot of you here. It, it's only $30 a year for the rest of you. Uh, uh, I can divide that into Starbucks. Um, what, how many of you are on the listserv? Okay, now, now this, is the, this is honesty early in the morning. How many of you find the listserv a total pain in the rear? That's right. How many stay on it anyway, right? And, and, and here's the thing. The listserv is a total pain in the rear. I loathe it. There's only one reason I stay on it, and, I, and this may be true for the rest of you. The only reason I stay on it is I learn something from all of you all the time that I can't get anywhere else. I get all those publications from the New England Journal of Medicine to I think our weekly reader is still coming to my mailbox. And I don't learn from anything else what I learn from the people in this room and the other people on there. And that learning amongst ourselves is our power. And so that's what I hope we all get out of this meeting. I've already been inspired by all of you in the room just from the evening and the, the ride from the airport. Um, Dave does it all the time too. And we're going to give you a little bit of formal uh, knowledge to help you understand where our movement came from. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Oh, I thought we were doing your slides first. Oh, no, <laughs> We're really well planned, spontaneous. Tell them who you are, and then I'll go slides. Okay, good. So, uh, in my slides, I'll do more of an introduction, explanation of uh, of who I am. My name's Dave DeBroncart. Five and a half years ago, I found out I was almost dead, and that same year, I got better. And along the way, I used the internet every way I could to partner with my physicians. And then, one of my physicians, Danny Sands, was one of the pioneers of this movement in the 1990s, he invited me to read their website. I went, holy crap, I am one, uh, and started blogging. And then in 2009, I wrote a blog post that 
ended up on the front page of the Boston Globe and we were off to the races. It's been, it's been a real Alice in Wonderland tumbling down the rabbit hole experience, completely unplanned, like this session itself. But that's the thing with cinder blocks or whatever, you know, we face crap in our lives, we get it together. Some of us give up, but some of us, everybody who's here, get it together. We use whatever resources we have to make the best of it. Okay? So. so. And this whole thing is unrehearsed because the slides didn't exist until a few minutes ago. So, enjoy. So what Dave and I have in common, among, among many other things, is a, is a love of history and a passion for this movement. Um, I was at one of the Health 2.0s a couple of years ago, and I realized that there wasn't a lot of understanding of the history. And to see yourself as a movement helps to understand the history. That's very important. Um, and and uh, as a matter of fact, in many ways, we arise out of the history of, 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 of these kind of movements. All right. I use this slide a lot to talk about the, the overview of quality and safety and patient empowerment. It is not health care reform. A reform is a correction of abuses, a revolution is a transfer of power. And the reason then that the American Medical Association is not asked to be an associate member of the Society for Participatory Medicine yet is that there is a a conflict between physician autonomy and physician accountability. Ultimate autonomy was the old days. A balance of autonomy and accountability is where we're going. And the revolution is we are taking power. Power is being transferred from the providers to others, payers and to patients. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's good, but it's inexorable and we are part of a revolution. And that is difficult. People do not give up power just because you say pretty please in a meeting room. Ah, the good old days. The abuses, American American Association Code of Ethics, 1847. Why the physician code of ethics said that patients should listen, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and this, of course, is they're watching web TV. Right? My judgment. That's what ethics is, my judgment, listen to me. And many very caring doctors believe that using their judgment on your behalf is patient-centeredness. And it is, but it's only part of what it is, right? This is a gentleman, Dr. Jay Katz, uh, died a few years ago. He was a refugee from Nazi Germany. He was actually involved, an ethicist actually involved in looking at the Tuskegee uh, uh, clinical trials aftermath. He wrote a book that Dr. Jack Winberg, uh, the, origin, uh, the originator of the uh, practice variation, uh, gave to me called The Silent World of Doctor and Patient. It came out in 1984 before any of us in this room were thinking about this issue, before anyone was thinking about this issue. And he talks about the fact that doctors always believed it was their moral duty to act as rational agents on behalf of their patients, so they've only maintained that their patients are only in need of caring custody. And I think because Jay Katz came from Germany, he asked questions that nobody else was asking. He was also a psychiatrist. And he said, it, I wondered, why should patients follow doctors' orders? Why are they called doctor's orders? It's a pretty revolutionary question. Doctor's orders? Caring custody? What's the relationship here anyway? And as we go forward, I think that those of us, whether we're providers or whether we're patients, we need to understand the culture of medicine, where it came from, and we need to talk about how we want medicine to change within the context of our understanding where it was and why it was and how it can change. Well, you always need a Rosa Parks. Uh, I blogged about Regina. When Regina picketed the American Hospital Association on give me my damn data, why was that so extraordinary? First of all, nobody bothers picketing the American Hospital Association. They're way too boring to picket. Pick, people picket doctors, they picket, you know, drug companies, but picketing the American Hospital Association, what's next? The American Association of Actuaries? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, the certified public accountants. <laughs> because she was talking about an issue 
that was beyond one disease, but beyond one patient demand, give us nicer rooms, give us a different partnership, treat us differently. We have as much right to our data as you do to make sure the doctor is happy because he doesn't have to give it to us for 30 days. We are your customer. Oh my goodness gracious, what an awful thought for a hospital administrator spending his whole life making the doctor the customer. This is a Rosa Parks moment. This is too. Do you realize that this is probably the only meeting of patients of its type ever? Really important to us to think and I keep on saying patients, I know many people here are not as patients, of a movement to have something different in medicine. We are a cooperative movement, a partnership movement, but a powerful movement. And you have to, broader concerns, uh, thank you Josh Rubin for lending me this slide. This is what we're doing. But what Martin Luther King did was also make sure that blacks understood the history of civil rights and understood the history of how they've been treated. And we have to understand our history and we have to understand our context. And just like he was black and white together, we are patient and provider together. We are a participatory, we are a society, we are a movement that is togetherness. Well, really quickly, um, I, I wrote a paper that came out at the end of May called patient-centeredness in the real world with the National Partnership for Women and Families. And patient-centered is really three different things, okay? And it really should be person-centered, and we can talk about that at a different time, but it's the ethical, it's the human rights, right? And that's what the Institute of Medicine talked about, and that comes from our bodies, ourselves, and from the civil rights movement and the feminist collective, to genuine consent. Nothing about us without us was a a, a slogan of the disability rights movement in the 1990s, which became nothing about me without me. And I remember talking to a, civil right, a disability rights activist in the early 1980s, and she talked about people, she, she had been a, a swimmer and she was paralyzed in a swimming accident, and she talked about people she called tabs. Has anybody ever heard the word tab? The term tab? Do you know what it means? The temporarily able-bodied. That stuck with me. The temporarily able-bodied. And for us in this movement, participatory medicine, most of us at some point will have to be on the participated with as opposed to provider end. The second thing is consumerism. That's a different thing than being a human rights. When you go to your doctor, if he treated you like a consumer, he would sell you more drugs on the way out and try to give you a special plan where if every 10 times you came, you get a little, little punch. The 11th visit is free. Uh, maybe if you came extra, you'd, you'd get a little extra waiting room uh, space, right? We are consumers. We want price and we want other kinds of transparency, but we're not only consumers. We have different roles, okay? And then the third is as a clinical data source. Very important. We are, we can give information that nobody else can, whether it's our genetics, whether it's our, our um, uh, remote device, whether it's our brains, whether it's our bodies. We are clinical partners. And that's a role that you need us as your clinical partner to get the best outcome, whether you treat us well as human beings or whether you treat us well as consumers. As consumers, we have rights regardless of the other. As human beings, we have rights regardless of everything. There are three different intertwined threads that are different. Uh, this says, when we want your opinion, we'll give it to you. <laughs> okay, this is the IOM definition you all have seen. 1947, and, and Dave and I came to this, this different ways. I went and pulled the New York Times from 1947. Dr. Spock was, in, was invited to speak to the AMA meeting in 1947. This radical thing. He thought that mothers knew when to feed their babies without the pediatrician giving them a feeding schedule. Giving, right? His book, Baby Care, had just come out in 1946. So the problem is, is that many physicians don't yet believe in partnership. Look at this, only 50% see shared decision making as very positive. They hold higher opinions of shared decision making where patients have more control. You can make a shared decision about your lifestyle, but you can't make a shared decision about your medical care. 
and patients are often afraid to ask. We've seen that. But not all of them. And Dave's going to talk about the e-patient movement. Consumerism, right? Different rules. This is J.D. Power III, the guys who rate all the autos. Different rules, but we're competent to make decisions. We're competent to recognize bad service. We deserve information. This is really interesting, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but I got this from an academic presentation. You'll hear people say the internet is totally unreliable. Yelp correlates with HCAPS, which is the scientifically valid, totally wonky measurement of patient satisfaction. Oh my god, you mean the internet can be as reliable as something that 17 PhDs developed? Right? Now the more transparency, Mass customization, this is where we're going towards, right? Personalize to me. Even if you're a big hospital, personalize to me and give me the experience. That's participatory. Treat me, treat me as well at the doctor's office as you do at the Marriott. Patients as clinical data sources, you all have heard of patients like me. Um, this is where we're going, but in a consumer-friendly way, right? tracing your pain, your physical pain, what happened with your drug, your physical activity, all these kinds of inputs, you as a clinical partner, and someone's going to take that from a medical informatics source, right? This is from the Journal of Biomedical Informatics, light bedtime reading, and they're going to make that into an app. And you can't ignore that if you're a physician because there's data there, not just fetching, there's data there that you can't get from anywhere else and now I'm a clinical partner and you can't ignore it. From the exam room to the boardroom, it's not just in the exam room, it's also how you design care. The paper I talked about, Patient Centeredness in the Real World, talks about models of places that have designed care, exam room to boardroom. The two that are length are the Patient and Family Centered Care at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Orthopedics Department, and Mercy Medical Clinics in Des Moines. Not your usual suspects. These are some other role models. A few bumps on the way. Jerry referred to the web to double check the doctors everywhere, every move, and of course, how's the self-diagnosis coming? Anybody here ever been wrong when they checked out Google? <laughs> Just a couple of times. And I will turn this over with enthusiasm to my colleague, Dave DeBronckhart. Thank you. presentation of the remote. By the way, if, um, if some of you have never seen it, uh, in the early days of the internet, somebody, uh, excuse me, a PowerPoint, somebody came out with a satire called the PowerPoint Gettysburg Address. <laughs> One of my favorites. It's an early PowerPoint, so it's time to do it. Here you go. All right. <laughs> I have had too little sleep and I'm excited, so you're going to get what you're going to get. Um, I want to be clear about something, and I'll be blunt, completely candid. It's hard for me sometimes, and I mean this honestly, to talk about the history of this movement, because as I said, in the Alice in Wonderland swirl of things, I ended up swept up in it. And so some of the story has to do with things that, that happened to me, but this is not about me, okay? Because if I were the only one, as I've told people like the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, there would be nothing to talk about, all right? So, just very briefly how I got into this, uh, and some of these are slides from standard presentations. I know some of you have seen them. Uh, I worked in high-tech marketing. That's where I learned how to give speeches. I talked to sales meetings and marketing conferences. Uh, I'm a data geek. That's how I came to understand that our health IT, our medical records, are severely mismanaged to the point of professional incompetence in many cases. Because what happened with my medical record could not possibly happen in a competent IT environment. 2007, I discovered I was almost dead and I got better, as I said. Um, lots of this is on the web, so I won't take time, and this is... But then in 2008, I started studying, I, I found epatients.net, which at that time was a very sleepy little blog with about a dozen posts on it, and I started writing there as a hobby. In 2009, I poked the button to move my data from my hospital into Google Health, and all hell broke loose. 
because what they sent over was not my actual medical history, it was my insurance records which were insane, and just the fact that they could possibly have thought that insurance records were valid medical information is an indication of how badly managed it was. I blogged about it and the Boston Globe called and said, we think this is important. What I didn't realize is that there was a move afoot in Washington right then to populate this new generation of medical record systems with data by uploading our insurance histories as if they were reality. And so one guy sitting in his living room late one night in Nashua, New Hampshire wrote this blog post and within two months that policy was reversed. Who could script this? If it were a Disney movie, people would say this only happens in Disney movies. Not only that, but they ran the article about it on the front page of the Boston Globe a week before the Health, Health 2.0 conference, and we were off to the races. Uh, in fact, so this is a, a statement that everybody, if you're going to be a card-carrying evangelist, you have to know some version of this statement. Patients are the most underused resource in healthcare. Now you can look at this as a human rights issue, but you can also look at it, I happen to come from the business world, so I think of things in business terms. This is a business inefficiency, a missed opportunity. We have this industry that is spending way too much money and not working well enough. We're overlooking a vastly important resource. Uh, the history of the movement. This is the summer of 1969. We first, I was 19 years old. I'd just gotten out of my freshman year in college. I remember watching the moon landing. This was the first time we'd ever seen a picture from another surface. Picture, that's the earth up there. Three weeks later, you talk about a wiggy time to be a teenager. I'll tell you, three weeks later was Woodstock. Uh, and in that era, let's see, I wonder if this next picture, uh, yep, that's me that summer. <laughs> Genuine hippie with the long wavy hair. Don't ask what that tube is sticking in my mouth, I won't tell you. And that fall, the whole Earth Catalog was published, which was a hippie journal. The subtitle was Access to Tools, and its medical editor a few years later was Tom Ferguson a young grad student, a young medical student just out of, uh, out of Yale, uh, and he was all about medical self-care, taking care of ourselves. Uh, and he, he wrote a, mag a, a magazine called Medical Self-Care and then a book of that name also, a compilation of articles from it. I found a used copy of it on Amazon a couple years ago and, and bought a real relic. Uh, anyway, he saw that when Routine medical care became a crisis and needed health care. A fundamental thing that limited our ability to produce value was access to information. And when the internet came along, he saw that that was a profound shift. And he started predicting things that would happen, like patients would connect with each other and learn things. Uh, and patients would be able to get at medical journal articles and things like that. And then, as time went by, he started spotting people who were doing this in reality. On the far left is Gilles Friedman, the guy who founded ACOR.org, the now famous network of, uh, of cancer patient listservs. Then there's and one of the founders of the Society for Participatory Medicine. Then there's Alan and Cheryl Green, pediatrician uh, couple uh, in the, the San Francisco Bay Area who founded the first physician website recognized by the AMA, drgreen.com, still in operation. I joined the group later. Then there's John Grohol, who currently is treasurer of the Society for Participatory Medicine. He runs Psych Central. Uh, and on and on across the, the Two who recently have popped up uh, toward the right side are Joe and Terry Graydon of peoplespharmacy.com. Uh, and they've, done, they've authored 10 books, they've done a, a, an incredible range of things. And Ferguson started calling this new kind of patient who popped he, up here, e-patients. And there's argument among the founders of the society about what the E really stands for. This is one common set of things, and electronic educated about evidence. That doesn't matter. I mean, it's convenient for speech making to be able, if you ever give speeches, a common th a thing you gotta really deal with is your audience will get stuck in the mud if they hear a term they don't understand. So you gotta give them a way to say, oh, I get it, so they can move on, okay? So that's why in that Health 2.0 conference a few years ago, uh, I 
put this slide together on the fly. Um, a little bit of historical synchronicity. You know, Michael mentioned that the term nothing about us without us came from the disability rights movement originally in South Africa. There are people in the US who think that it came out of a Salzburg seminar on shared decision making and patient-centered care. Uh, and th this is the book that I wrote I just published what had been my cancer journal, Laugh, Sing, and Eat Like a Pig, and without knowing what Michael's thinking was, I had put in 2010 in the prologue of my book that precedents of the e-patient movement included Dr. Spock, baby and child care. You know, the opening words of that book were, trust yourself, you know more than you think. Right. The other precedent that I cited that I remember very well from when I got out of college in 1972, a year later there was an uproar in the feminist, caused by the feminist community in Boston because these uppity women had published a book called Our Bodies, Ourselves that taught women how to look at their genitals including using a mirror. Oh my God, how could they possibly do that? And the establishment said, don't do that, you can't trust yourself. Well precedence for the e-patient movement. And that book now is in its 13th edition. Um, this is from the Health 2.0 uh, that happened right after that front page Globe article. Matthew Holt, the guy who, some of you know the name, the guy who runs Health 2.0, he is a British rugby fist fighting kind of guy, very smart at business. And he told me that Google Health and my hospital were going to be on stage one day during that conference. He said, Dave, you just might want to be in the room because I just might call your name. Well, I forgot about that as I forget about most everything. So when he called my name, I happened to be up in a balcony uh, just because there was more leg room and an electrical outlet for my laptop. And so when he said, is he patient Dave here? I stepped up, I, I stood up and I said, I'm up here. Well, people turned, Ted Eaton, our great friend from Kaiser, later said on his blog, in all the conferences he'd ever been to, it was the first time the industry had turned and looked up to a patient. <laughs> and somebody took out her iPhone, took this picture and tweeted, Pope Dave preaches from the balcony. <laughs> Not, just crazy, you can't, like I say, Disney, like Reese Witherspoon with Legally Blonde, except I don't have a chihuahua. <laughs> now, here are a few factoids, and uh, how can it be? This, in all of my speeches, I mention these, and as you evangelize this movement, okay, that I'm fond of saying, I am not a physician, and nor are the people I talk with in my patient community, and yet we have legitimate good information. Within two hours of joining the ACOR kidney cancer community, I got a list of bullet points of information that were incredible, and five years later, and accurate. My oncologist has validated that this is accurate. Five years later, there is no FDA certified or American Cancer Society or anything website, that, any, any industry website that has this information. So how can this be? I mean, I am not anti-science. I believe in the scientific method. When Tom Ferguson died, he was working on a, a grant from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, fabulous people, uh, to study the leading edge of what people were doing on the internet with medicine. And this document, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, in fact, if somebody will remind me, I have some chapter summary, sort of a Cliff's Notes version of this, that I should put on the blog. I've been meaning to for years, but I need reminders. Anyway, this document is a free download. Last year it was translated into Spanish by some of our Spanish members. 122 page thing cataloging the things that people were doing on the internet that were impossible in the old view. Uh, he quotes Dr. Donald Lindbergh, the director of the last National Library of Medicine, as saying, if I went home and read two medical journal articles every night, at the end of a year, I would be 400 years behind. It is not possible for anyone, including the world's best doctor, to know everything anymore. And it is no insult to any doctor if a patient has seen a relevant article that they haven't. Turns out this number was in the 1980s. The current number is that in 2010 alone, 800,000 new journal articles were published. It's entirely reasonable for us to go looking for things. Now, what we do in a participatory relationship, we don't come in and say, hey, jerk, why didn't you show me this? Right? We say, hey, I found this, what do you think? And a participatory physician doesn't roll their eyes 
et cetera, a participatory physician says, let me look. My doctor sometimes will say, yeah, good stuff. Sometimes will say, no, stay away from that. And about half the time he'll say, I don't know, let's look. And he'll teach me how he evaluates things. Now, people will commonly say, and I'm, you know, I'm stuffing a bunch of my personal calls to action into this talk because I have to leave around 2 o'clock today. I won't be here for the whole thing. Uh, I'll skip ahead. I don't, I don't want to run out of time. It's not humanly possible to keep up. Then there's the lethal lag time. After research is completed, before it reaches your doctor's office, is two to five years. Now, when I was diagnosed, I had a median survival of 24 weeks. This is a problem. The idea that scientists might have added new information to the human knowledge base, but it hasn't reached the point of care yet, all right? That's a problem. And what you find, as many of you know firsthand, is in good, engaged patient communities, patients are talking to researchers who haven't published yet. And then finally, death by Googling. Zero cases have been identified of death by Googling. The, a doctor went out looking to try to, he uh, truly, I mean, 10 years ago, he wanted to find true stories of patients who died by getting stupid advice like eat arsenic for your health. And he found none of them. And in contrast to that, this famous report from the Institute of Medicine to Ares Human documented 98,000 accidental deaths a year. The number is actually way larger than that. Medicare records were audited two years ago. A paper was published showing that one and a half percent of all Medicare admissions end in accidental death. Accident, not dying from your condition, accidental death. And it helps a tremendous amount to have either the patient awake and engaged in all discussions or the family at the bedside because a common cause of trouble here is not having enough attention on the details. And the white paper, Ferguson's white paper, he died in 2006 unexpectedly. His team finished this afterwards, uh, said it may be more dangerous not to Google your condition. Uh, and it said these conclusions are no more anti-doctor than Copernicus was anti-astronomer. Health Leaders Magazine got wind of this movement in 2009, and I'm gonna skip ahead because there's something I wanna do because I'm rowdy. I'm gonna sacrifice the rest of my talk to get ahead to this. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, let's see, this one, this is being a marketing analytics guy in my day job, uh, I will occasionally run a search for how many, how, how many times our favorite words show up in Google. So things like e-patient, patient empowerment, patient engagement, participatory medicine. And there are the numbers from 2007, 2008 before the society was formed. 2009 the society was formed and we got busy, 2010 and 2011. So you could say we're doing something of a job of spreading the word. Uh, so that's one of the things your society is doing. You know it's a movement. I said this at Josh Cantor's Learning Health System Summit. You know that a movement is starting to become a revolution when the artists and musicians show up. So here we are with Regina being the artist who showed up. Uh, I gave a TED talk in Holland a year and a half ago where I did the e-patient rap. I want to be an e-patient just like Dave. And what's amazing here, some people can't believe that patients really want to do this, but within two months of this video going live on TED.com, it hit the top half of the most watched TED Talks of all time. It ends with the chant, let patients help. And for people to have, it's up to 380,000 views now. I say this is a pretty good indication that people are passing it to their friends. And another huge thing is at first people said, well, okay, Dave, your case is real, but you're a college graduate. Then one day in Washington, Regina said, I'm not. I'm a high school graduate. And then people said, well, all right, it's well, but it's only in America. And then it turns out there are e-patients in Spain and e-patients everywhere. Trained volunteers can add subtitles to a TED Talk. And down in the bottom left, there are 26 languages. All right, Persian, traditional Chinese, Bulgarian, simplified Chinese, and so on. I say there's evidence that this is a universal human drive. The forces of nature on our, are on our side. And then 
So this is a new slide. Susanna Fox's data at Google, uh, at the Pew Internet Project, documents that people do this. Well, I like to play with words. So we take Bing, Google, and Yahoo, and what do we get? It's the e-patient boogaloo. And here is Ross Martin's rousing and wonderful way to start a, to start a Saturday. Come on, make music, come on. No sound coming out? Where is it? Where is the sound? It's all about me, so it's mine. You can cut up my heart, take it to the dump. Give it to the, the dog, place it with a bomb. You can make me pop pills just, just to keep me alive. But there's one more thing. For those who don't know, this is Todd Park. He reports to Obama. He's in charge of technology for the United States of America. And this lead guitar is 16. What's up with that? You can knock me out to treat my bloom. Lock me up in a rubber room. You can tie me down. And I'm saying, ladies brain, and gentlemen, this will start to hear 60s from this song applied to this one. That's Danny Sands. He's my doctor. Give me my damn data. It's all about me, so it's mine. Give me my damn data. Give me my data. Not just my data, but give me the chance to get everybody's data. Now, of course, Jamie Haywood, some patients like me, he wants everybody's data so we can learn his empathy. That was all done not for first and Ted Bed at the Kennedy Center last April. People asked me to send in my slides a month before a meeting. I'm like, are you kidding? I don't know what I'm gonna say. Again he is mine. And, well, this is Ross Martin. I mean, he chased me around with his video camera. Said, now, there's a poignant thing here at the end, so after the credits here, I just want to finish up with what, an example of why this is important. That's Ross's wife, Kim. Both he and she have incredible e-patient stories in their family. I got to listen well, I know I'm a minute late, but I got to do this. 1983, Kim had lymphoma. As was the custom in those days, she got heavy radiation. Well, just last week, we learned she has breast cancer, which is not an uncommon thing 30 years later. The doctors want to know how much radiation she got. Nobody knows, because they need to know how much they can give her safely now. The records weren't saved. They're allowed to throw them out after a few years, nor were they given to her in case she might need them someday. This is not academic, folks. This business about give me my data, and I'm out of time. Uh, thank you, every one of you, for seeing something in the future that got you to get yourselves here. Uh, we, we're at the beginning of something great. They, I'll close with something I wasn't planning to say. Do, do you, the, um, a year ago, I was speaking uh, in Philadelphia at a group called the National Board of Medical Examiners. They certify every doctor. Uh, they they got to pass those boards before they get... And in my hotel room... Oh, oh, there's a video camera over there. I'm terribly sorry. Thank you, sir. See, he's empowered. He spoke up. He was not a victim. All right? A disempowered person says, oh, crap, well, there's nothing I can do. An empowered person says, speak up, all right? Well, there was a program on there about the Stonewall riots, which were a turning point of the gay rights movement. Uh, and one of the, they had a whole bunch of guys who had been there, cops and the gay guys, uh, who were interviewed these many years later. And one of the guys, this, you know, 
biker gay guy with his old leather jacket and everything, said that the one thing that struck him was there was a song from the civil rights movement by a, a folk singer I'd never heard of called Malvina Reynolds. Uh, and it, it's, there was this question of why do you guys have to be so uppity and causing trouble and everything? Uh, and this song was, It Isn't Nice. And it went something, some, I'm, I'm not in good voice, but it isn't nice to block the doorway. It isn't nice to go to jail. There are nicer ways to do it, but the nice ways always fail. You know, we've told you once, we've told you twice, it isn't nice. And I think we're going to start to see, see, when you start to speak up in any empowerment movement, some people say, oh, okay, no problem, sure, I'm happy to do what you want. And others smack you down, and others will just plain get in the way. What we know that, we're, that what we're working for is right for our families, our children, our elders. Thanks for the work you do. So, uh, I, I, I want to add very briefly to that, 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 that going forward, and David's right, and if you look at the article I get in Journal of Participatory Medicine, Spock Feminists in the Fight for Participatory Medicine, everything we won was through court and by fighting. Literally, the right for a patient to know what a doctor was doing, not informed consent, to be told in advance what surgery the doctor was going to do for you was a Supreme Court decision at the start of the 20th century. Informed consent did not come until the 1970s, well after the hippie movement, right? Uh, informed consent in English. So the Society for Participatory Medicine were pretty modest dues at 30 bucks, but the number of members that we have is what people look at. The participation of people like you who are smart and caring is what we depend on. We've got a lot of programs going forward. We can talk about that. You can catch Dave and I in the halls today some. And uh, we need you to catch the spirit. Thank you.